few men have tried to corner the wheat market, only to find that there is too much wheat in the world. I tried to corner the graft market, but I learned that there isn't enough money in the world to buy up all the public officials who demand a share in the graft. George Remus. Confident his many payments to Jess Smith had immunized him from punishment, George Remus had continued to expand his business. In less than a year, he had made some $6 million. He had established a new supply depot in Ohio and owned nine distilleries, had interests in others scattered from Buffalo, New York to Glendale, California, and was on the lookout for still more. But eventually, he went too far. He had bought the Squibb Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and found himself operating in the jurisdiction of a capable and incorruptible prohibition director, Bert G. Morgan, whom Remus would later come to call the stumbling block of the Middle West. Morgan's suspicion was first aroused when his men began seizing trucks and automobiles filled with bottles wrapped with newspapers from Cincinnati. Then they traced a shipment of squib whiskey to Remus's headquarters at Death Valley. Morgan's agents arrested everyone and confiscated a small arsenal of weapons, $40,000 worth of alcohol, and Remus's business records as well. Remus wasn't unduly concerned. His government withdrawal permits covered all of the whiskey that was seized. And besides, Jess Smith had assured him he would never go to prison. On New Year's Eve, Remus gave a memorable party to inaugurate the vast Roman-style swimming pavilion he'd built on the grounds of his Cincinnati mansion. He had named it the Imogene Baths in honor of his beloved second wife. Every guest received a gift, specially made diamond stick pins for the men and diamond earrings for the women. Remus drank only water that evening. He was a lifelong teetotaler. A few months later, the government indicted Remus for violating the Volstead Act 3,000 times. Mabel Walker Willebrand herself decided to supervise his prosecution. The evidence the government presented at the trial was overwhelming. It took the jury less than two hours to find Remus guilty, and he was sentenced to serve two years in federal prison. Remus appealed and hurried to Washington to see Jess Smith. As always, Smith was reassuring he promised that Remus would never have to serve a day behind bars, just to make sure the bootlegger handed over another $30,000. A few weeks later, someone handed Remus a newspaper. Jess Smith had shot himself in the bedroom of his suite at the Wardman Park Hotel in Washington. He had been named in an investigation of corruption in the old Harding administration. Remus was still so confident that no serious harm would come to him that while awaiting his appeal, he bought the Jack Daniels distillery at St. Louis and ordered his men to siphon off every drop of whiskey. The Court of Appeals affirmed my sentence. The Supreme Court refused to hear my case. The game was over. I had nowhere to turn. George Remus was on his own and eventually found himself in handcuffs and on the way to the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. But he quickly adjusted, bribing officials to make his life in prison as comfortable as possible. And he consoled himself with the thought that while many of his old friends had deserted him, he could always count on the love and loyalty of his wife Imogene in whose hands he left his fortune and the opulent Cincinnati home they'd lived in together. In all the pain and humiliation of the thing, my one consolation was my wife. She had been my partner in everything. She knew the inside of all my deals, 
she kept books on transactions which could not be entrusted to the office force. There was nobody in the world whom I trusted so fully. We agreed that when my term was out, we would take a long trip around the world and then settle down where the disgrace would not follow us. Concerned about rumors of bribery at the prison, Mabel Walker Willebrandt sent one of her best agents, Franklin L. Dodge, to investigate. The warden and chaplain lost their jobs. Remus lost all his privileges. And then he lost his wife. In the intervening months, Imogene Remus had begun a romance with Agent Dodge. Together, they set about systematically looting her husband's assets. They sold off his distilleries, his stocks of liquor, and the liquor withdrawal certificates for which he'd paid more than $200,000. She also filed for divorce. Dodge is taking everything that is most precious to me, Remus said. He has ruined my life forever. He brooded for months behind bars. And when he was finally released and went back to Cincinnati, he found the home he and Imogene had shared stripped of every stick of furniture. He collapsed. It was the supreme double cross. Remus had been betrayed by everybody he had trusted. And now, at last, by the one who owed him the most. On the way to his final divorce hearing, Remus spotted his wife and stepdaughter driving through Eden Park in a taxi cab. He ordered his driver to force them off the road, jumped out with a revolver, and shot his wife. Then he turned himself in. It was a duty I owed society. She who dances down the primrose path must die on the primrose path. I'm happy. This is the first peace of mind I've had in years. The murder trial was a national sensation. Remus's defense was the same one he'd tried unsuccessfully to present in Chicago, back before he'd gone into the bootlegging business, temporary insanity. He acted as his own co-counsel, sometimes conducting skillful cross-examinations, sometimes weeping or moaning incoherently and he made sure everyone understood how his late wife and her lover had betrayed him. The jury deliberated just 19 minutes before it returned to the courtroom and declared Remus not guilty on the sole ground of insanity. The courtroom erupted in cheers. American justice, I thank you, Remus shouted. The juror explained, that since Remus had had such a rotten Christmas last year, they had decided to make him happy this year. 